Without the sun, our planet would be lifeless, cold and very dark. The sun and other stars release energy which is transported through space and some of this energy reaches the earth. The kind of energy that travels from the sun and other stars is called electromagnetic radiation. Hello and welcome to our series called Investigating Electromagnetic Radiation. In this series, we will investigate the properties of electromagnetic radiation. We will also show how scientists have developed models to describe electromagnetic radiation and explore how people have used different forms of electromagnetic radiation for a variety of purposes. We will also examine how our knowledge of this important form of energy has contributed to advances in technology, including the development of lasers and electron microscopes. If you get up early, you will see the energy from the sun lighting up the earth during sunrise. And if you stand outside and let the energy from the sun fall on your back, you will feel warm. Now, although heat and light are the only two forms of energy from the sun that our bodies can detect, it is important to know that the sun actually radiates seven different forms of energy. We'll find out more about these types of electromagnetic radiation during this series. In this lesson, we will explore what electromagnetic radiation is. We will conduct practical investigations of its properties and examine a model scientists use to describe it. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe how to determine experimentally the properties of electromagnetic radiation. Make conclusions about the properties of electromagnetic radiation based on your observations and solve problems using a model of electromagnetic radiation. We have already seen that light is one of the types of electromagnetic radiation that travels from the sun to the earth. Light has some very interesting properties. Can you recall any that you have learnt about previously? In case you can't recall all the properties of light, have a look at some experimental evidence to remind you. From what you've just seen, it should be pretty clear that light travels in straight lines. Now, what can you conclude from this experiment? Of course, light can be reflected. Now, can you remember what happens when light enters a perspex block? Notice that the ray of light changes direction at the boundary of the air and glass. This change in direction is evidence that light changes speed when moving from air to glass and from glass to air. We call this change in speed refraction. You should recall that refraction occurs whenever light moves from one medium to another. Traveling in straight lines, reflection and refraction are typical properties of waves. So, light has some wave properties. Can you remember that there are two types of waves, transverse and longitudinal waves? A transverse wave is made up of a series of crests and troughs. Notice that in this kind of wave, the particles of the medium move at 90 degrees to the direction in which the crests of the wave move. However, a longitudinal wave consists of a series of compressions and rarefactions. Here, the particles of the medium move backwards and forwards parallel to the direction in which the wave moves. Because of the difference in particle motion, these types of waves behave differently when passing through a gap. Here, I have a standing wave apparatus. 
the vibrating source here moves up and down and sets up a transverse standing wave on the string. The string moves up and down too. Watch what happens when a cardboard gate with a vertical gap is placed over the string. Notice that the transverse wave can pass through the gate. Now see what happens when the gate is rotated through 90 degrees so that the gap is horizontal. Did you see that the string after the gate is no longer vibrating in a wave pattern? So the wave was not able to move through the gate when the gap was horizontal. This shows that there were no horizontal vibrations and the vertical vibrations were blocked. As the vibrations were not blocked when the gaps were vertical, we must conclude that this transverse wave on the string moved only in one plane, in this case, the vertical plane. However, when a transverse wave is set up in a slinky on the floor, the vibration is now only in the horizontal plane. This wave would be able to pass through a horizontal gap, but would be stopped by a vertical gap. Now, let's consider a longitudinal wave. Notice that a longitudinal wave can always pass through a gate, whether the gap is horizontal or vertical. This is because the particles move parallel to the direction of the wave. So clearly, longitudinal waves behave differently to transverse waves when passing through a gate. Now, let's see if light behaves more like a transverse wave or more like a longitudinal wave. To do this, I'll need to go outside to test light from the sun. To test sunlight, I'm going to use these Polaroid lenses as my gates. A Polaroid lens is like a grid or picket fence with very small gaps all lying in the same direction. Notice that sunlight passes through the first Polaroid lens. You can still see the flower in the background, even when I rotate the lens through 90 degrees. It seems that light is behaving like a longitudinal wave. But now watch what happens when I place a second Polaroid lens in front of the first one. You see that light still passes through both these lenses. But now when the second lens is rotated through 90 degrees, all the light is stopped. What conclusions can you come to about the nature of light from what you have seen? Let's go back to studio to analyze our observations. The fact that light was blocked by the two Polaroid lenses when one was rotated through 90 degrees means that light is not a longitudinal wave because a longitudinal wave is never blocked. This means that light must be a transverse wave. But we saw that light was not blocked when a single Polaroid lens was rotated through 90 degrees. So, light cannot be a transverse wave that is confined to one plane only. From these observations, scientists concluded that light from the sun must consist of two transverse waves acting at 90 degrees to each other. Let's look at a model of what happens when light passes through the Polaroid lens to understand why this is so. When light meets a Polaroid lens that has vertical spaces, the vertical component continues, but the horizontal component of the wave is stopped. If the lens is rotated through 90 degrees, the vertical component is stopped and the horizontal component passes through. When the spaces of the Polaroid lenses are both vertical, the wave passes easily through both lenses but the light wave has only got a vertical component. Now, when the second lens is rotated through 90 degrees, the spaces of the lens are now in the horizontal plane and stop the vertical component moving through it. So now, all the light is blocked. I hope you now see that our model of light as two transverse waves explains what we have seen when using the Polaroid lenses. Remember, light is only one of the many types of electromagnetic radiation. 
scientists have conducted similar sorts of experiments with the other types of electromagnetic radiation and have established that they too display the same wave properties as light. In other words, all electromagnetic radiation has the properties of transverse waves and can be thought of as a combination of two transverse waves that act at 90 degrees to each other. Now, let's find out why this form of energy is called electromagnetic radiation. You have previously learned that there is a relationship between magnetic and electric fields. Remember, when a charge moves through a conductor, a magnetic field forms around the conductor at 90 degrees to the direction of movement of the charge. So a moving charge produces a magnetic field, and the converse is true too. When we move a magnet in and out of a coil of wire, we can see that a current is induced in the coil. We can see this as a changing reading on the galvanometer. This changing reading indicates a changing electric field. So, a changing magnetic field creates an electric field that also changes in magnitude. Keep the relationship between a changing magnetic field and a changing electric field in mind as we now look at a model of an electromagnetic wave. A model that was first stated by a 19th century Scottish physicist by the name of James Clerk Maxwell. Maxwell said that when a charged particle moves from rest to a higher level of energy and back down again, in other words, when it oscillates, a changing magnetic field forms around the charged particle. But this changing magnetic field induces a changing electric field at right angles to it. And this changing electric field in turn induces a changing magnetic field at right angles to it and so on. In other words, each field generates the other and a continuous electromagnetic wave will be produced as long as charges oscillate, that is, moving up and down. As the charged particle moves, the magnetic field, shown by the blue line, will increase to its maximum strength, represented by the crest of the wave, then decrease back to zero. Now it will move in the opposite direction and increase to its maximum strength in this direction, represented by the trough of the wave. And then, once again, it returns to zero. But as the magnetic field changes, so it produces an electric field at 90 degrees to the magnetic field. The electric field, which is represented by the red line, will reach its maximum and minimum strengths at the same time as the magnetic field. This means that the two fields are in phase with each other. We can clearly see that an electromagnetic wave consists of two transverse waves, which are perpendicular to each other. Note the following characteristics. The electric field is in the same plane as the oscillating charge, shown here in the vertical plane. The magnetic field is always perpendicular to the electric field. So here it is in the horizontal plane. Notice too that the frequency of vibration of the charge is the same as the frequency of the wave produced. When high energy charged particles accelerate rapidly, high frequency electromagnetic waves are produced. These electromagnetic waves have a very short wavelength. But when the frequency of the vibrating charge is lower, the frequency of the wave is also lower, but the wavelength is longer. The charged particles in the sun oscillate with different frequencies, and so they produce a range of electromagnetic waves, all with different frequencies and wavelengths. This range of electromagnetic waves is called the electromagnetic spectrum. 
all the waves of the spectrum travel through space or in a vacuum at the same velocity, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. The symbol for the velocity of an electromagnetic wave is C. Now remember that the velocity of any wave is related to its frequency and wavelength by the equation V equals F times lambda. Now I want you to use this relationship to complete your calculation for today's task. Calculate the wavelength of a beam of red laser light with a frequency of 4,74 times 10 to the 14 Hz. In our next lesson, we will explore the electromagnetic spectrum in more detail. Bye for now.